Good evening. I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, Dean of the Honors College, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Sharper Focus, Wider Lens, our first session of the 2017-2018 year. I'd also like to welcome those joining us on live stream and thank the Alumni Association for their participation. Considering that our speakers will be time limited and that we do have people on live stream asking that you take your cell phones and put them on vibrate or some other mode of silence so as to not disrupt anything. On this evening, we'll be talking about water wars, our H2O futures. Before I do introductions, I'd like to ask you to save the date for our second sharper focus wider lens of the fall semester, which will be Monday, August 30th at 7 p.m., again here in the Union at Michigan State University Ballroom, or live stream, did I say something other? August. How about October 30th? <laughs> October 30th. And it is Being Russia, the past, present, and future of a superpower. And just an example of how we help each other out here. Thank you, Joan. Um, Joan Rose will be our first speaker on this evening. She is the Homer Nolan Endowed Chair in Water Research in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Joan is director of the Water Quality Environmental Microbiology Laboratory and co-director of the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment and the Center for Water Sciences. She is an international expert in water microbiology, water quality, and public health safety, publishing more than 250 manuscripts. In 2016, Joan was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize, the world's most prestigious water award, and she earned her doctorate from the University of Arizona. To my immediate right is Dave Heinemann. He is professor and chairperson of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Dave's research interests include developing novel methods to characterize the aquifers that store and transmit water supplies critical to human and ecological health, developing, helping develop methods to clean contaminated aquifers using emerging technologies such as bioremediation and the quantifying human impacts on changes in climate and land use on the water cycle. His research involves coupling models with high resolution field data to explore the physical, chemical, and ecological processes in natural and anthropogenically, I did not say that right, <laughs> altered systems. He earned his doctorate from Stanford University. To my immediate left is Jade Mitchell, an assistant professor in the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Jade's research interests include risk assessment, understanding the chemical and microbial stressors from diverse environmental exposures, including bioterrorism and food safety. She does quantitative analysis, decision analysis, Bayesian statistics, and systems analysis as part of her research. And she also conducts dose response and exposure modeling, including both exogenous and endogenous fate and risk management and environmental policy. She has earned U.S. Environmental Protection Agency awards and earned her doctorate from Drexel University. And finally, to my far left, William Taylor is a university distinguished professor in global fishery systems in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. He is an internationally recognized expert in Great Lakes fisheries, ec ecology, population dynamics, governance and management. Throughout his career, Bill has been active in the American Fisheries Society, serving as the president of the society, president of the Michigan chapter, and of the North Central Division. He currently holds a U.S. presidential appointment as an alternate U.S. commissioner for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and he earned his doctorate from Arizona State University. We've asked each of our panelists tonight to speak from their area of expertise, and their job is simply to do that and not necessarily make connections across each other's talks. So if they happen to coalesce, great. If they seem 
very different, that's fine because it's my job to try to make meaning across the different topics. And we always have excellent um, talks from our panelists, so I expect none less tonight, no pressure, right? <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand off to Joan. <clears throat> thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Honors College. And um, actually, all four of us up here have worked together, so I think there will be uh, some connections, and water kind of connects everything. And you can see that on my first slide, I actually have um, uh, a credit there uh, uh, in terms of the work that uh, I've done with the hydrologist here and Dave to my left. So conflicts. Well, I study uh, water quality and I study microorganisms that get into water through fecal pollution. So um, I guess my dad, you know, he called me Queen of Latrine. And uh, when I was a kid, I don't know if that influenced my career choice, but you see, uh, what I do is I follow the feces around. So wherever the feces go, I go, and that can take you to some pretty interesting places, some that are not so nice. Um, but we're really interested in both uh, microorganisms that come from animal waste and human waste. And the two exposure pathways, and maybe Jade will address some of this, that we like to explore is, is through uh, recreation and drinking water are some of the two major uh, exposure pathways. And all kinds of different microbes, viruses, bacteria, uh, protozoa, helmet worms. So we look at all different kinds of organisms. So really the conflict comes around because we want to know if water quality is changing and that's not easy to do in a, in, in a temporal scale. We don't always know, um, how, is it getting worse or is it getting better? Um, we want to know why it's changing and how it's changing. So when we do find hot spots and, and pollution sites, you know, how did it happen? Why is it happening? Um, and what does it mean for health? That's my interest. Does it mean something in terms of public health risks? And should we be doing something as an intervention to uh, uh, prevent exposure and health? And then finally, of course, people like to look um, for someone to blame. So um, the farmers want to blame the urban and the sewage and the urban uh, community and their beaches want to blame upstream users and CSOs and um, Toledo and Lake Erie want to blame the farmers for the algal bloom. So there's always that element of someone upstream is probably, um, then that's where some of the conflict comes in. Now we've had a number of these um, uh, disease pathogens and issues right here in uh, the Great Lakes and right here in Michigan. Um, Across the border, we've had a very serious outbreak in a little, in little uh, um, farming community, and uh, very sad because uh, young children died uh, in this small community. And it's really hard to go into a community and look people in the face and say, you know, your kids died because of contaminated tap water uh, when we live in North America. Uh, this uh, changed groundwater rules in Canada, and we're not so different in Michigan, many of our communities from that little community. We've also had a, an outbreak in Putin Bay uh, caused by sewage. You've heard about the Legionella outbreak probably and distribution systems in Flint, the toxic algal bloom in Lake Beer, Erie that shut off uh, the water to about a half a million people. The norovirus outbreak, it was a recreational outbreak. Uh, a new park opened, it was great, you know, and uh, uh, people got sick from the norovirus. Um, cryptosporidium, an outbreak during a fire uh, event where they used surface water uh, at a farm to, and both the uh, firefighters and others got sick, um, which was due to calves. So we have these events that happen here uh, in our own backyard that we need to take care of. Now, um, one of the things that we're promoting are new technologies, and these are water diagnostics. So we have a lot of compliance in water quality. But we're interested at MSU in doing engaged research where we take the new technologies out to the community and we try to use diagnostic tools. One of the questions you always have is where did the pollution come from? And that's been a, a question for over 200 years. And in the last decade, we finally have these DNA technologies, sort of like CSI, you know, where you take the water sample and you can look at that fingerprint. We do the same thing for water. And we can start to look at the sources of pollution. Did it come from cows, pigs, 
They come from humans. Now, one of the things we can't always tell um, when we find the human marker, did it come from the sewage treatment plant? Did it come from septic tanks? Did it come from the septage, the stuff you pump out of your septic tanks, which you should be doing, and, or biosolids that come out of uh, wastewater plants? But through uh, analyses, looking at hydrology and land use, which is what uh, we were working with, with Dave groups on, we were actually able to look at 64 watersheds in the lower peninsula of Michigan and actually show that the human marker increased in watersheds where there was increasing septic tanks. So increasing number of septic tanks meant increasing human sewage marker in those watersheds. Now, this was important for the state because we don't have a state sanitary code, and now they're starting to talk about could we put a rule in place that would guide the state, guide the counties, guide management, guide remediation uh, towards septic tanks, towards these non-point source pollution markers. So this is very important because what we see when they've done studies, if you look at those pictures, is about 30% of our old septic tanks, our old infrastructure, is failing. We've got pooling of water, it gets into our surface waters, our groundwaters. We were also able to look at animal markers, the, the cow marker and the pig marker, and what was interesting is that baseball, that's during the winter, and nothing's moving, it's kind of frozen, just a little bit of water's moving. Um, we only saw about anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the watersheds positive for these markers. When we moved to the summer rains, through spring melt to summer rains, those markers began to move everywhere in the state. And so we now can see what's happening over land from our manure practices and look at how rain impacts that and start to look at concentration. So this is presence absence, but we can also look at where are the hot spots? Where are the watersheds that had hot spots? Um, and it was quite interesting because what, what it showed was that if you have a buffer around your watershed, that is, you have natural vegetation, and you don't have septic tanks in that buffer, and you don't have ag in that buffer, nutrients go down as well as these markers go down. So this means that these natural buffers are important. This is something we can go back into watersheds and promote. Finally, we've got uh, a new challenge ahead of us is looking in water distribution systems. We have hundreds and millions and billions of pipes around the world, around the United States, in our communities. And they all support a um, microbial biofilm. And when Legionella, as you can see, Legionella disease in Flint, it bloomed when they changed the water system during the summer. There's other reasons why it bloomed. We're not sure what. But we've seen this in other places. We've seen these outbreaks. Legionella is the number one cause of waterborne disease in the United States. So studying now the pipe system, how do we go from a watershed and study a watershed and the sources and what happens to a pipe system. Finally, I'd like to end by saying that we've been working with the state on promoting this new diagnostic technologies in labs all over the state, working with EPA, training people in the laboratories. And this means that these labs now are capable of doing source tracking, rapid E. coli testing, Legionella testing, um, and uh, this has been a uh, two to three year uh, project um, and supported by the state. Um, and this is what we want to do here. It's, it's the, the biggest con, uh, group of labs in any state in the United States that is focusing on this new technology. And it's a model for what we might want to do in the world. So I want to thank all the contributors. You never do this, these kinds of things alone. Um, uh, of course, your students and your postdocs, your colleagues, all help you anytime you go out in the field and start taking water samples and bringing them back, trying to understand what's going on, where the conflicts are, and how do we remediate water pollution. So thanks for having me very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Joan. We're now going to have Dave. I'd like to also thank the Honors College and thank you all for coming. Um, as Joan mentioned, we've worked on a lot of things together and I'm stepping away from the water quality bit for my talk and talking more about water sustainability and big issues all around the world for how do we feed even our current population, let alone the growing population of the planet. 
I also like to thank all my, my students, postdocs, and, and undergrads that work in our research group that make all this possible. So the work I'm going to talk about is interactions between irrigated agriculture and everything from climate to long-term sustainable water and groundwater. So what I show here is a map of irrigated areas across the United States. And you see some, some key regions, like the central United States, the central high plains, which is right through this center region, California's Central Valley, and some others. And one of the things that we wanted to figure out is what are the paths that these regions are on? Can they keep pumping groundwater the way they have in the past? And is there actually an influence of this irrigated agriculture on climate, more broadly speaking? You're taking a lot of water and pumping it out of the ground and putting it on plants, and it goes back to the atmosphere. Does it have an effect that we can actually notice? So what we did is we have a, a project funded by the National Science Foundation to look at the High Plains Aquifer, and it's really the breadbasket of the United States. It, if you look at the land use, which is this center map here, it is 97% either agriculture or rangeland. So really the vast majority of this region is being used for agriculture. And as we move from north to south across the eight states that are involved in the aquifer, we have fairly humid conditions to the north and it's fairly sustainable. We move further south and it gets drier and drier and things are getting really pretty desperate in terms of the future for that system. So there's a huge amount of data the U.S. Geological Survey and Kansas Geological Survey have been collecting data from a huge number of wells through time. They go out once a year during the non-pumping period and they monitor the groundwater levels. And on this map you can see the blue colors here are basically stable water levels. So despite the fact that they've been doing a lot of irrigated agriculture, it's humid enough to the north that you can keep going on with this kind of process. But you move down to the south into the central high plains, Kansas, Nebraska, southern Nebraska, and even worse down into Texas. You've actually pulled out more than 50% and to the south even 75% of the groundwater. So all you have is 25% left. That's a serious crisis when irrigation is absolutely critical to food production and really the economies of these regions. So to look at it in a slightly different way, if you look at the map on the upper right here, this is the decline of the volume in the aquifer. And the total is about 400 cubic kilometers of decline. As a reference, that's about the volume of Lake Erie. So it's a huge amount of water. This isn't the amount of water they pumped out. This is the actual decline in storage. And on this bottom plot, you can see the northern high plains is this yellow color, fairly stable. Central High Plains in blue has been reduced by about 25% on average, and the Southern High Plains by about 50%. Clearly not sustainable. To make matters worse, we have climate change. And in the north, where it's already fairly humid, all these blue colors means the projections are, it's actually gonna get more humid. You're gonna get more rain. Well, that's great for Nebraska. But you move down to the Central and Southern High Plains, and it'll get about eight to nine percent drier. So again, a real challenge for the region. And to show you the importance of irrigation for agriculture, I have two plots on the right, and it shows the amount of yield that you produce from corn on the top and wheat on the bottom. And these are based on simulations with the code that Bruno Basso in our department wrote. And what you see is through time, from the 70s through current, the lower line here is not irrigated, the upper line is irrigated. You roughly double your yield. So pretty important for those farmers and also for general food production. And if you look down at wheat, you see fairly similar things. So again, about a doubling of the actual yield. So there's good news and bad news. The yields are increasing through time, that's due to a lot of technology that's going into the fields. But the bad news is, a lot of it's going up also because of irrigation. But we're not sustainable. So the last couple slides here, I want to show you this linkage of irrigation to the atmosphere. 
do we actually have a measurable effect? So what we did is we took a regional climate model, it's called WARF, in fact it's one of the predominant models that's used for the weather forecast that you see, and we run one set of simulations with no irrigation. We then added irrigation to this model, and the climate scientists hadn't yet done that, and what we do is we show the changes in precipitation and temperature. It turns out they're actually rather dramatic. So you think about that central portion of the United States where we're doing a lot of irrigation, well, what's downwind of that? Well, basically a whole series of the East Coast, even up into Michigan, we actually get more precipitation. Not too surprising. You add more water to the atmosphere, you're likely to get more rain. And then we looked at the temperatures. And you're actually decreasing the temperature in the East Coast, especially during the summer, as a result of irrigation. Well, why would that happen? adding more water to the atmosphere, turns into more clouds, it's more cloudy, less solar radiation hitting the ground. So it all makes sense. And we actually compare it to the data and actually this fixes a big bias that the regional climate models have had. So this is just a small portion of the kinds of things that we do in our research group, but wanted to bring up the concept of water sustainability and linkages of the climate. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Jade, if you want to go ahead and pull up your PowerPoint. And while we're doing that, so that you know after each panelist has presented, we'll present an opportunity that if they want to comment on each other's talk or reflect on something and immediately following that, we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you um, to the Honors College and for all of you for attending. Um, I'll start off by saying that I'm not a social scientist, but after I talked with John Beck about my topic, I became really interested in what people think about where their water comes from. So with limited resources, I asked a few people I know, and you might guess from the pictures <laughs> um, who I asked. <laughs> um, but their explanations included diagrams, and they contained surface or groundwater um, and some source of filtration um, or purification method. Um, in most places in the United States, when we turn on the tap, we can expect clean water. Um, so I asked another question, um, how does it get to the tap? So here my answers included pipes, uh, some type of storage, and another set of pipes connected to your house. And the narrative looked a little bit like this. Underground or lakes or rivers, it gets filtered somewhere, I don't know. It gets sent to people's houses through pipes, maybe some big ones that you can just connect to. Like if you build a new house, you can just connect to it. And then there's that thing in the basement wall. <laughs> so next I asked Professor Google for some images about the water treatment process. And most of my respondents' answers are captured here, along with more details about unit processes that are in place to remove contaminants to certain EPA-regulated limits, um, and also for health protective targets. But there was a gap in this image um, where my interest lies, and that was between the pumping station and the tap. Going forward on this particular site, um, there was a description of the water distribution network and the service lines, um, which connect to houses and to other types of buildings. But it still didn't really address how does the water get to the tap. So I asked my respondent again, and this answer was, then that thing in the wall connects to all the faucets, like the sinks and the bathtub, but not the toilet water. I don't know where that comes from. There's no point in having sterile water to poo in, so I guess that water is somewhere in between. I thought that this was an insightful response, especially because it included the possibility of gray water. But it was also an opportunity to talk about um, the concept of being sterile or absent of microorganisms, 
or totally clean. Our tap water isn't sterile, and the pathways that it takes from its source to our tap are not sterile um, either. Um, our water is delivered um, with a chlorine residual um, or some other disinfectant residual, and that's designed to control pathogen growth um, or bacterial growth until uh, we consume it. There are trade-offs between that level and taste and also other health effects. So this premise plumbing system is w what I'd like to talk about. It's fairly complex and it can be very large, 50 to 150 meters, um, with many different connections and types of materials. Um, it has temperature gradients. Um, it also has uh, variability from building type to building type. We know that bacterial numbers can increase in this environment, and that some of the things that influence their increase um, are listed here, one of them being stagnation, or just the time that they're in residence um, within the system. Um, also, the usage pattern, so how frequently we're using the water or flushing it. Uh, Joan mentioned biofilms, which um, are increased in the premise plumbing system because of the high surface area and the small pipe diameters. So in addition to uh, general bacteria, we know that pathogens um, can be harbored within the plumbing system. And when we look at waterborne diseases in the US, a large percentage are associated with drinking water, especially in environments where we have variability in occupancy rates and usage, and also where there are sensitive subpopulations. There are also a number of considerations that we need to think about in terms of stagnation and water usage patterns, um, water conservation and water efficiency, for example, um, reduces the flows in these systems, and these systems are designed for much larger capacity in a lot of cases. Also, water reuse and water availability. Um, Water reuse is uh, a good alternative, but it too can introduce um, opportunities for lower flows in systems that were designed for, for much larger capacities. And also water affordability, like the shutoffs that we've seen in, in Detroit. So the problem when water sits is that chemicals are allowed to leach into the water, which sometimes provide nutrients for pathogens to grow, um, the time allows for the growth, um, and there's also sedimentation of other precipitates. When the water flows again, there's the opportunity for mobilization of pathogens that may be in biofilms, um, the pathogens themselves, the sediments, and other contaminants like lead. Um, and here, here lies the conflict. We know that premise plumbing can magnify public health risk associated with water distribution, but there's a gray area in the jurisdiction that um, the EPA can't regulate your premise plumbing systems. The building owner's responsible for what happens after the property line or after the service line, except for the lead and copper rule. So while there are many tips um, for safe drinking water uh, in-premise systems, and you may have seen some of them, um, we really don't have an integrated, comprehensive approach um, or building code that addresses all of these issues. Understanding these risks um, and the issues and jurisdictions and decision-making around these are the types of things that we're studying in my lab. Okay. Thank you, Jade. So first I want to thank Michigan State University
for giving me a career that allowed me to work with lots of partners and to better understand glo both locally and globally the dynamics between fish and humans and the importance of that. And of course, fish depend on water and um, that means that there's gonna be wars between different groups because water quantity and quality that you heard earlier determine how, you, how good your fish are. You gotta have habitat and water in order to have fish. And so I learned over life that fish needed a person that would have voice. Voice for them to uh, speak because they're kind of unseen and unheard and undervalued often in many parts of the world in relationship to other uses of water. So I thought this was very appropriate and I'm really happy that the Honors College put this on and invited us. Thank you also, John, for all the help on this. But John knows that I like to fish and it's on the Great Lakes and I do like to fish. But I didn't get into fisheries because I like to fish. I grew up on Lake Ontario near Rochester, New York, which was heavily polluted when I was growing up. That alewives were watching up, blue-green algaes were in the water. Nobody would have thought about fishing the Great Lakes. But what the fish did was they integrate everything. Because if you think about what the, where does uh, particulates go from the air, what happens when the landscape is disturbed, it goes right into water. And all the water then, anything that's in the water, has to integrate this, so they're the great integrators. So to me, they were an ecological symbol of how one could really engage with how good humans are doing as environmental stewards. So I always like this slide because we've talked throughout all our careers in many disciplines, but particularly in ours, about you know what we need and how we ought to do it and what we, how do we get more value and woe is me. And, and so we say, are we making any difference? We're howling at the moon and is anything happening? So I went to my next uh, choice to ask if, since we didn't know if we were making it, I decided to take two dogs, my two dogs, Springer Spaniel. And you notice the young one, which is alert, saying, yeah, we can make a difference. Your generation did make a difference, even though you like to talk about today's problems. There was a lot more problems in the 60s in clean water and a lot of environmental issues than there are today. There are certainly significant issues today, but there are not as many as there was when I was growing up. And we accepted it, that that was just progress until the late 60s, early 70s, when people said we're not going to live that way and we made a big difference. And you can see the older dogs sitting there, they said, oh no, not again. I'm tired of this talk. And, and so what you don't want to do is become complacent like the older dog did. Just that I can't do anything about it. You want to be like the younger dog saying, I can do something. We're, tell me how to act. Give me a road map. As I mentioned, if you want fish, you've got to have habitat. And habitat, of course, is quantity and quality of water. There's structure in the, in the waterways that you need to have. So, but you start with what people are talking about here is habitat is simply the place where an organism lives. Physical, chemical, and biological variables define the place where that organism lives and how productive it will be. A complicated diagram, but I'm sure these will be available on the Honors College website, is the productive base of fish. You see the quantity of water and quality of water, and that comes from land use, groundwater, surface water uh, relationships. It comes from if there's pollution coming in from the chemistry, what the soil characteristics are, how fast percolation is going, this stuff we heard earlier today and throughout. But if you don't have fish in that equation and you're making that decision on how much, where the quantity of water goes and what quality it's going to be, and fish aren't in, in your mind, you're going to make mis uh, errors and lose fish. Fish are 27,000 species, most species, vertebrate species in the world, and I think the coolest. So the basic premise is, you have to maintain habitat, you have to enhance habitat to get healthy fish. If you have a healthy fish population, then your ecosystem is functioning well, a thriving ecosystem, it's doing what it's supposed to do, and you can have societal prosperity. And the societal prosperity is in food security, in recreation, in aesthetics, uh, and many other areas that we'll talk about. In uh, 1995, there was a th major threats to aquatic ecosystems. And if you look at that, there were nine things, and these are the things that people have been talking about today. Everything from habitat destruction and fragmentation by water weight, by putting dams in waters, 
for hydropower, for uh, transportation, to pollution that comes off the run, uh, the uh, landscape, um, toxic algal blooms. You know, we heard a lot about HABs in recent years in Lake Erie, invasive species like the Asian carp coming up the, the waterways, all kinds of things. But nine of the nine variables that were there, seven of them were habitat related. So that meant we had to work with people outside the waterscape itself. Outside of people, they were thinking about fish, they were thinking about water for other uses, or not even recognizing that what they did on the land or the air affected the water that affected the fish. So who's the problem? This is a cartoon from the 1960s in the newspaper, and it says basically that they meant the enemy and it's us. And us are getting bigger, a number, larger number of people. A larger number of people are going to need more water. They're going to need more water for power, for energy production, uh, for agriculture, you name it. And so water is going to become more and more scarce. As was said, it's not equally dis distributed throughout the world. There's going to be those like us that live in water-rich environments and people will be trying to tap it. And believe me, the Corps of Engineers knows how to move that water. Just ask California. They know how to move it very, very well. Well, what's the impacts of humans on fish? We talked about land use and land cover. There's also the governance. You've got to have governance to, to talk about how do you, in the bargaining table of politics and of humans, what's most important? Where do you weigh in on what's important? And how do you influence that at the federal level, the state level, and at the international level? Because these are international boundaries. Show it's not just developing world. A lot of people think the problems are all in developing worlds. I want to show you something on the U.S. 24% of all land areas in the lower 48 currently used for agriculture. 5% are urbanized. 79,000 dams of at least 25 feet are highly impounded of at least 50 acre feet. This is just in the U.S. That blocks fish from movement. And then there's 200 and more than 240 gallons, billion gallons per day withdrawn from surface waters. And Dave talked about uh, groundwater. What's the impact? Well, on the fish and aquatic animals, since 1900, 123 aquatic freshwater species have become extinct in North America. The future of extinction rate is supposed to be 4% per decade. 20% of the world's freshwater fish are extinct we're in serious decline. Of the 822 species of native freshwater fishes in the U.S., 39% are at risk of extinction. So this is pretty severe. And of course, what is our normal reaction? Find somebody else to blame. It's not our group, it's not our commodity, it's not our organization, it's those other people that don't think about it and don't care about us and woe is me, what are we going to do? So in fish, what do we do? We use a hatchery and bring in new species because we can't control the water quantity and water quality, so we have to bring in something that can live in the newest water quality and quantity. So we became people that used uh, hatchery systems to bring fish in that could actually live there and provide a fishery, but it's really about what can live in the environment to control other part of that ecosystem. So what's the steps towards sustainable governance? Well, you got to demonstrate value. If you're going to be on the bargaining table politically, you've got to have good values on what, what is the value and their worth to people and for what purposes. Engaging people and organizations, NGOs have become very, very powerful in the last 30 years. They've been around longer than that, but the rise of the NGO has been really, really important in, and uh, in terms of making sure the fisheries are there and water quality is, is good, and it's, it'll continue. Consistent, coordinated efforts between the different agencies and jurisdictions, alternative components to the fishery to supply chain. You just can't say we're not going to fish anymore. Fish provide food for many places in the world. Americans don't eat a lot of fish in general. Africans do. Southeast Asia does tremendous if you take it away. But actually, that chicken you eat at night, 40% of its diet's fish. It comes out of fish meal. And so you just get it second round. Without that, you won't have the production of livestock or poultry. So what do you got to do to demonstrate value to people? Nutrition and food resources. How many people thought about fish as food security? 
It is big food security. Recreational value. Yes, it is, but there's not as many people in the U.S. fishing as there used to be. About 15% of the general population fishes. You have quality of life. People enjoy knowing that fish are there. It gives them a sense of place, a home, that if the system is working good, then they're happy. Economic values, intrinsic values of being there, and societal values for these. And of course, it talks about human health. If you have a healthy system, you have good, healthy populations. So you got a choice. Do you want to collapse the fish stocks, or do you want to have them more sustainable? And the whales say to each other, but can they even say themselves? It's a good question. We have to first realize there's no free lunch. No matter what you do with water, no matter what you do with fish, there is no free lunch. The way you collapse it is what we've been talking about. Don't have value for it. They have poor governance systems, lack of awareness and communication. Don't have the scientific data. If you don't have the data, good, hard scientific data, you're not going to stand up against the power companies or agriculture which have those information. So what's your options? Sustainable fishery resources, recognize the interconnectedness of the social and ecological systems first and foremost. These are coupled human and natural systems. Support stakeholder knowledge, expectation and values. Have alternatives and be adaptable. Make sure you're resilient and adaptive. Understanding and utilizing the whole fishery supply chain to its fullest potential, we often don't think about that. And clearly communicate and demonstrate value in a timely manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. So just a couple of observations across the talks. Um, where we looked at water quality and water sustainability, and you could also talk about scarcity. Where does water really come from? How do we get it from those sources into our homes, our businesses? And what are the dynamics between fish and water or nature and water? And so some of the things we need to think about is how do changes in water quality affect public health? And the fact that contaminated tap water is a reality all across the world. We can't just say it's a other problem. There's no othering here. We're all in this together and really thinking about what does it mean to have contaminated tap water. And how do we take new technologies and get them out into the community? I mean, that's as true as it is for issues with water as anything else that we do in the research community. And what's the interaction between irrigated agriculture and the climate? Right, so this whole idea that agriculture will always be important in the world as long as we need, well, one might argue, maybe one day everything will be um, created somewhere other than on land. But while it's still being done on land, we know that we need to make sure that we increase capacity to develop food. And what does that mean when we're depleting groundwater? And how are we changing the nature of experiences for different parts of the country and different parts of the world as we develop our agriculture and at the same time change what happens? And so we're affecting economies, we're affecting quality of life, we're affecting the environment and the climate, and do we have good answers yet about what comes next? And thinking about whether we get our water from lakes or other sources, it ultimately has to traverse through a system of pipes and aquifers and things of that nature. And, and along the way, what are we doing to remove contaminants and ensure that in the process, we're not further creating contamination? And have we given good thought to what that means? And it was really interesting when we talked about the septic tanks, because increasingly you have homes being built in areas that don't connect to municipal water supplies. So as we continue to do that, what are the implications for us as a society as a whole? And the role that government regulation does and does not play in these various factors, where it starts and where it stops. It can come up to your doorstep and then it's up to you to make everything work. Well, you never knew that, right? So what do you do when things stop working and there's a problem with the water quality and everyone's passing and pointing fingers. How do we get past that? And how do we think about the impact on all species, not just humankind, fish species, other species that depend on water? How do we protect habitats? How are we mindful of having healthy fish 
for the sake of the fish themselves and for the role that they play in the food chain and in the ecosystem, how do we ensure that we have food security and that we can continue to enjoy recreation and the aesthetics that come from water? And what do we do to recognize our role in protecting multiple species, in protecting agriculture, in protecting public health, in protecting the environment? And we have multiple tensions. We have environmental issues up against health issues, economic issues, against developmental issues, and all in the mix is who's responsible, who takes action, and at the end of the day, if things don't go right, who takes blame? And really thinking about the land use and land cover, groundwater, surface water, how are we really looking at the dynamics of how this all plays out to ensure that we have a sustainable water future? Those are some of the themes that came across to me from the panelists, and I'm just wondering if the panelists heard things from each other that you might want to comment on or reflect on now would be an opportunity to do so. <clears throat> well, I'll just mention that I think um, this idea of precision agriculture is going to be important in the future. Um, as we irrigate more, we don't want that water running off. And there's a lot of tidal drains, and, and all of that will contribute to non-point sources, nutrients, and others. So um, the more irrigation, obviously, the more uh, we want that to be precise. So that the water that is put on the, the crop stays is, is exactly what the crop needs. And uh, I think one of the problems in, in Michigan is we don't have infrastructure for irrigation. I don't know if you want to mention, say anything about that, Dave. but. It seems like they'll truck water around when we have these days of drought um, because they don't really have the, the irrigation infrastructure. So it's not very precise. The interesting thing is with climate change, irrigation is actually expanding significantly even in Michigan. It used to be something that was almost only done for seed corn, but now more and more there's significant drought and farmers may go through one drought and say, well, that's okay, but this time drought hits a second time, they say it's worth investing in it. And to follow up on a point that, that Joan just made, there's, there's a real connection beyond just irrigating, it's the whole management of the land. You know, there's a huge amount of nutrients that go on these cropping systems and farmers generally make sure they put at least enough on, in fact, they put a lot more than they need on the fields. Some of that goes back to groundwater, some flows through surface water, eventually flows out to the Great Lakes, which can cause harmful algal blooms, and also feed back with fishery systems. So I agree with Joan that really precision agriculture is one of the, the key things we have to look at long term to, to keep as sustainable as possible. One of the things that I think is important is a combination of groundwater and surface water. You're not making new water these days. and um, you think about fish and a stream's temperature is dependent on how much groundwater comes in versus how much surface water. And as climate changes and gets warmer, you're going to see a change in the species that can live within those warmer waters. And if groundwater is depleted, then the cooling temperatures uh, that buffer the warmer waters that you come out on the surface in the midsummer will, will disappear. And we're doing a study right now which are looking at the salmonid populations, the trout populations uh, in Michigan. And it's pretty dire predictions about what's going to happen in many of the streams in Michigan as groundwater uh, disappears because groundwater will not be able to buffer as much of hot water coming in. So you, got, you can be pragmatic and say for some of those streams that live on the edge of the temperature right now in the southern part, be prepared for smallmouth bass because they can live in warmer water. And, and, and others, you can say, what can we do to keep water cooler? There's things you can do in the landscape, on the watershed, in the riparian zone particularly, but one of the things that you have to do is maintain a landscape that allows for good percolation and good groundwater recharge. Otherwise, there won't be that buffering. John, it's now to you and audience questions. Well, uh, hi everybody. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll come to you. And um, 
wonderful stuff to start with, so please let's see some hands and uh, come your way. Oh, I had to go all the way over there. Thank you, Danita, for that <laughs> little bit of exercise. Now, by the way, Jade, you, uh, you made my wife's night because the fact that things that she does, you said are the right things to do, and I've been, you know, just... <laughs> His wife is a lot smarter than me. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> Here we go. I have a question for Jade. Oh, what yeah. is it with hotels? I'll never stay at another hotel. What's going on? Please don't do that. <laughs> I know. What, what? Um, my talk wasn't meant to incite fear. Uh, it's just that the usage patterns are so variable um, and they're so large that depending on where, which room you're staying in and what system is being used for assigning rooms, um, the water there could stagnate more than in other places. Well, kind of related to that first question, I have a challenge for each of our panelists. I mean, you've told us a lot of very sobering things. Could you please put a positive spin on each of your areas? What, what, what good has come from your research, a uh, positive thing? There's a, there's a challenge. I'll start. So I think the setting up of the labs and the ability, so the, uh, they're able to do rapid um, testing on beaches. So before um, you'd take a water sample and you wouldn't get the result till the next day. So basically people that, you, when you warned somebody about a beach, you were talking about the past <laughs> instead of the current. And so now they've got uh, approaches that, um, where they can get real-time information, or almost real-time, that, that day information where they can tell the public uh, whether it's safe to go swimming that day or not. I think it also, um, also the ability to do more of this testing, particularly with pathogens, and not rely on these indicators that don't give us very much resolution, um, is allowing us to do better modeling. And, and Jade, you might want to address this, because the complexity of these pipe systems is just crazy, even trying to sample. We were doing like 30 samples in one little house, and it's going to be impossible to sample. We're going to have to use models and new tools. So I don't know, Jade, if you want to mention these, um, these yeah, I was because it's so complex. I think that's technology. the great frontier is the, the pipes. Right. <laughs> Um, we have better tools for understanding microbial ecology in different environments, including pipes. So we can start to look at um, how some of the considerations that I listed are changing that ecology. Um, and then from there go with, uh, you know, looking at solutions. So I think that um, it's, it's a positive thing to know this and to be able to test it. So th thanks for the great challenge, Danita. <laughs> but there actually is a lot of positive. So as an example, in Kansas, now that people are really understanding the influence they're having on long-term groundwater levels, you're getting local partners, a series of farmers getting together in a community and deciding that together, they're gonna reduce the amount of irrigation they're putting on by a substantial amount, by 20%. And this was a test that had to go through a lot of vetting from the state government all the way to the federal government to allow them to do this and get insured. And what they're finding is they're not having reductions in crop yield and they're moving back toward a much more sustainable system. So I think as we have the science to support better policy, and if that gets down to the, the ground level, in this case the farmers, and they say, well, okay, we believe that and we can make better choices. And let's do it together as opposed to having a, you know, a conflicting environment. Okay, I'm gonna hand the microphone. But, but, Wait, but John, we have Bill. John, oh, Bill, John. Bob Fish. See, once again, not cooperation. No, um, uh, that's a great question because right now, I've challenged my students in our profession at the American Fisheries Society, and I said all my life, all I hear is how bad people are and how bad we've done. We always talk about all of the bad things. I said, have we never done anything good? Did all our efforts for the last 150 years do nothing that restored populations or helped? Because this is pretty depressing if you've spent a whole career in this. And so we were writing a good news fisheries book now. 
And the good news fisheries is where we're, have we had success? Because we usually don't talk about those. We talk about impending threats or, or actual threats. And I think if you look at the Great Lakes, I left the Great Lake of Lake Ontario and went off to college in 1968. And I showed back in Michigan in 1980. When I left the Lake Ontario, there was no fishing, no big marinas, no water recreation to speak of. Some water, some sailing with sunfishes, some motorboats were skiing, uh, but it was, it was a cesspool really. It, it, my parents had a house that lived uh, two houses away from Lake Ontario, we could see it. We used a technological solution. We built a swimming pool instead of taking care of the, the lake. Come back to a $7 billion fishery in the Great Lakes when I show back up in 1980 here. It's a Clean Water Act with people getting together and talking about how we improve the environment. We weren't going to have this cesspool. And the Clean Water Act was passed in 71 and amended in 78. Cooperation between many different agencies. And I would say that's a huge success story. OK. Thank you so much. I am the uh, spouse who was referred to who appreciated uh, Jade's comments about running the tap for a while if you've been on vacation. Um, I have two questions. Um, I'm a social scientist with a great degree of uh, respect for those in the physical and natural sciences. And I have a question that I think is probably basic science, but I've actually wondered it for a long time and I don't know the answer. Is the issue that over time, if we think about the whole globe, that we will just run out of water, in which case then I wonder, in the cycle of how things work, where does that go? Or is the issue that water is moving so that some areas become arid and other parts of the globe actually have too much water? Or I heard groundwater and surface water, is it that some of it is kind of in the wrong place for what we need? Or is it you know, one of the issues that what we have will always be there, but it's getting polluted. So I'm not quite, I, I just don't understand the basic science of whether we're losing water or whether it's more contaminating and we're just doing things that push it in the wrong place. The other question, if anyone uh, chose to answer it, is one thing I've also wondered about a lot lately is bottled water. Um, whether bottled water actually is good water and what its implications are uh, for the kinds of issues we're talking about. Is it a good idea to be using bottled water or is that really just adding to our problems because of the plastic and so on? Thank you, if you can, I, I'm sure this is a complex science question, but I don't, I've often wondered sort of where does the water go? Well, they're, they're both great questions. Uh, I could address both. I'll, I'll do the first one and then see if Jonah wants to start the, the bottled water one. <laughs> So in terms of global water supplies, I mean, you think about basically the amount of water is conserved globally. I mean, you're basically evaporating a certain amount from the oceans, it's falling on the land, and then it's flowing back down toward the oceans one way or the other, surface water, groundwater. But we as humans come in and we drastically alter a lot of the, the local cycles, right? So you take a certain, maybe it was a grassland, and you make it into agriculture, and you irrigate it, that has a dramatic effect locally. And especially if you're in a region that we're actually using what's commonly referred to as fossil groundwater. So a lot of the groundwater I'm talking about in the central high plains is old groundwater. There's a small amount of recharge in some of those southern areas, but it's tiny. So basically we're pulling out old groundwater and once you pull it out, very little groundwater gets back in, into the ground. The other issue that's really important is with climate change, we're having less and less snow and glaciers in the mountains. I actually just came back from China on Friday, and there's big conflicts between China and a lot of countries because China has a lot of glacial ice and a lot of snow up in the mountains, and they're capturing a lot of that water and using it before it goes into other countries. Well, the, the issue is that we're basically melting those glaciers a lot faster now. And that's been a long-term source of water. Once those glaciers are gone, or once they re get reduced, that's a huge issue. And, and that's when you really are gonna potentially see wars over water. You gonna start a bottle of water? Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's where the water is, I think, over time, and where the people are. So in civilizations, they 
They um, built their communities on waterways for transportation, for potable supply, and to take waste away. And um, so we, you know, we've changed that distribution. We've changed the hydrologic cycle. But also the water quality's changed. They talk about the great acceleration. So from the 1950s onward, you see some flattening out, but almost every parameter you put on that scale sees a very high rate of acceleration uh, during the 50s onward for the next 30 years, and that's population growth, water use, so water withdrawal and use, egg production, beef production, pesticides use, um, and commensurate with that is a land change. So globally, wetlands decrease like this. So our capacity for carrying the water and also probably the water quality. So we're putting more pollutants back in. We're using more water. We're putting more return flow. So water quality is definitely degraded in the near shore um, because of that acceleration over the last 50 years. And uh, so quality and quantity have, have changed. Um, uh, it's impacting, uh, you know, communities. We have solutions, reclaim water, other things, but desalination, it's expensive. Um, the issue of bottled water. Um, so the bottled water industry is really a commodity. They, they're, they're governed like a food, like, you know, a steak or anything else that we buy. However, they have a philosophical uh, problem because they're competing with what comes out of the tap. And they also, there's a lot of concern that they don't, um, they don't pay adequately for the water that they withdraw. But that same argument could be said for agriculture. So we say, okay, we're going to subsidize the farmers and let them take the water cheaper because we get this food benefit. So the bottled water industry has a philosophical issue with that. And they also have an issue with um, waste and recycling. And so the bigger companies do need to look at that, uh, philosophically how they support the watershed in their community, wastewater disposal, uh, plastics recycling, those kinds of things. So it's, it's corporate responsibility. Uh, but. Um, uh, the, generally, if they follow the International Water Association's uh, guidelines, and you can tell on a bottle of water whether it says that or not, um, they use ozone and membranes, so the water is more highly treated than what we might get out of the tap. Um, however, there could be bottled water that comes right out of the tap in the community, and then it's sold to you for a much higher price. It's very expensive compared to our tap water. So it also creates a problem with value, the value of water. So um, yeah, I'm not against bottled water, but the bottled water industry is, uh, is like any other industry, and they, but they have a philosophical issue on corporate, corporate responsibility, you know, demands that they start to look at water differently or talk to the community differently about water. Okay, so do raise your hands. Uh, but John, there was a question all the way up front. Are you good? Okay. Oh. We answered your question. Where? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me ask this question while I'm walking up here. One thing that, that maybe occurs to people is we hear a lot about the idea that we have, uh, through chlorine use, through uh, using Purell and other things, uh, have, in, in effect, taken away our uh, natural uh, defenses against specific bacteria. Um, Jade, you know, you're really talking about all the things that are, you know, like in your shower head, and we heard about that on NPR, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So the issue is how susceptible are we to a lot of things that are in our homes, and to what degree uh, have we kind of uh, lost our own natural protections against some of the bacteria that, that might be available in the environment? Or anyone else who wants to take that on? So uh, the pathogens that I was talking about were primarily opportunistic pathogens. Um, and I mentioned in the one slide on the waterborne diseases um, percentages that a lot of those are, occur in sensitive subpopulations. So in facilities like nursing homes and in hospitals. 
Um, we all probably took a shower today and we, we didn't get Legionella. <laughs> so, um, that we know of, that we know of, right? <laughs> um, so in terms of susceptibility, um, I don't know that I can really address that except because it's more complicated than just exposure. Um, the, the populations that we're really concerned about are not the general public for all of these, these pathogens. Do you wanna? Yeah, I guess um, for, for organisms, resistance to chlorine, um, we don't see that in the same way we see antibiotic resistance. So it's because of the way chlorine acts on bacteria and kills it or viruses or even parasites. So um, their resistance to, they don't, they don't uh, create genetic resistance to chlorine uh, that, like they do other types of antibiotics. So they don't have the same genetic c capacity. Um, so, in, but as Jade mentioned, about 25% of our community is in a, se a sensitive population now. That's another thing that's changed. So we have more elderly, we have more immunocompromised. We come home from the hospital uh, quicker and we um, take our immunocompromised drugs or whatever and we're at home. And the other thing, as Gerbo always says, right? What's he say? How much time do we spend indoors now compared to what we did? That's changed how much? 80%, 90% in time? It's, it's 90% now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's probably changed. 80%. So we, we spend all our time in a different environment than we used to because we're indoors all the time. Maybe not in Michigan. Maybe we go outside more, but I don't know. I got two questions, actually. One for David. Um, I noticed on your simulation map the irrigation area was cooler downwind, but it actually was warmer where it was your, your, the irrigation was taking place. Any idea why? So, so there's a couple of different effects there. If you think about when you irrigate the land, you actually change what's called the albedo, so you make it darker, so you're actually absorbing more solar radiation. And then you're also basically taking that water and putting it in the atmosphere locally. It's not really turning into clouds, and that can also increase your local temperature. The other thing that the scientists that's running these models found is you're actually changing the large-scale circulation patterns, like where the high and low pressure systems are. There's so much change in, in moisture by just applying irrigation that it actually affects the whole circulation. Thank you. Question for Joan, then. For 40 years, I've been composting my kitchen waste in my garden, and I, I live in the, the recharge area for the aquifer that our town gets the water from. Is there any way that bacteria can get down to the ground, groundwater? Yeah, so, yeah, bacteria um, do travel. Um, and for composting, however, um, generally uh, you're doing it dry. You might add a little bit of moisture. Uh, but you don't have these, what we call, um, hydraulic conduits that form like you do in a septic tank drain field. So if you think of a drain field, especially if, if it's a home that's being used quite a bit, the water comes in, it flows into the subsurface, it creates these continually wet little conduits, and you can probably talk about this a little bit more. And bacteria can move through those much more, much faster, uh, than they would if they were just going through soil that was a little drier. The other thing about composting is you heat it, up, generally it heats up. And heat tends to sort of pasteurize what we, what we think of pasteurization. So um, as you compost, you heat that up. When it gets up to, you know, it can get up to 35 degrees, 40 degrees C, you start to decrease, let's say, bacteria that would cause a problem. So let's say you, you're putting stuff out there that has salmonella or campylobacter, you probably are pasteurizing some of it in a composting system. But yeah, bacteria will travel. It's very dependent on how wet that system is, um, how saturated it is, uh, and they'll travel through those systems, yeah. So uh, my question, I have two questions actually. The first one is related to the pathogens that you were talking about, Dr. Rose. Uh, can animals also be affected by those pathogens, and are they at risk for the, the same things that humans, humans are at? Yeah, so we have a whole, a whole list of those pathogens, half of them we call zoonotic pathogens, and that means that they can infect animals and humans alike. And so what, uh, that means that our um, 
you know, our uh, pollution affects animals and their pollution affects us. So for example, the outbreak that I talked about up in Canada that was so sad was due to manure, and both those pathogens came from manure, Campylobacter and E. coli 057. Um, also, our, our pets, our pets like to share our, our uh, <laughs> infections with us, and it's mostly the bacteria and protozoa, uh, two groups, um, sometimes the worms too. Um, those are the main groups that are what we call zoonotic. And so, yeah, we're concerned with both animal health and uh, human health. So my second question is on public reception of this kind of information. Um, I think it's awesome that we're all here and very open to, to these ideas and, and the science. But I know from experience, having worked in Dave's lab, that the public is not always open to these kinds of ideas. So how have all of you kind of approached dealing with that sort of resistance or sometimes hostility in, in the public? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been in some public hearings that were pretty heated. Um, and one of the issues was like septic tanks are, uh, when I was working in that area in Florida, it's um, a, a community that is on fixed income, it's retired, and the, the city council voted on a sewer because the pollution was there, and um, they wanted everybody to pay $10,000, $20,000 for hookup, and then pay a monthly fee. And it was without consultation with the community and without knowing what's the priority, who should go first, you know, where should we fix things first, where's the, the biggest problem. So, um, and I work with the water industry too, and the water industry sometimes likes to put their heads in the sand um, when a problem arises or a new pathogen and we don't have a solution yet. But I always try to look at both the problem and solution if you can at the same time, but I think it still needs stakeholder discussion. A lot of um, talking has to be done, the pre presentation of the science, um, and then a solution that, and for water, for me, it has to be both state and federal support for our water systems. And it can't always rely on just the individual because we can't actually afford it. Um, we did a back of the envelope calculation on the billions of dollars that was needed for infrastructure the American Civil Society uh, of Engineering has suggested. And like for 20 years, every man, woman, and child would have to pay like $70 a day to pay for it, if they had to pay for it themselves. That, we can't afford that. We have to have our state and federal governments help us pay for our water infrastructure. I, I, I think, you know, when I first started in the profession, the uh, fisheries managers, were people that felt that they knew what, they, what needed to be done to get fish back in the water, to grow fish, to have it. And really the rise of the NGOs came in the late 50s, um, 60s, 70s, which then said, we need to work together. And it was that uh, interaction, that stakeholder interaction, that allowed for a much broader discussion on what was important and how do we best do it and why would we do it here and there and so I think those, those uh, stakeholder communication, instead of us knowing what, what's good for you, that we need to figure out what's good for us. And that was a big change in, in fisheries. Okay. I, I can give one example. I think you've probably already heard this, Jeremy, but the, I've given a lot of talks to farmers, and a lot of farmers aren't, aren't real big believers in climate change, even though climate change isn't really a belief, it's a fact. And so when I'm speaking to, to these groups, it's very interesting because what I do is I'll actually step back from the human-caused portion of climate change and I'll actually ask a lot of them questions about has, have you noticed things being different recently relative to several decades ago? And you know, almost all of them will raise their hand. It's, it's more variable, you know, there's, there's changes that are occurring. And if you think about the context people are coming from, then you can actually put your, your talk together in a way that kind of brings them into the discussion. And in, in the case of, of climate change, farmers are actually the most affected by climate change, right? If there's more droughts, if there's more floods, if there's warmer temperatures that affect their crop yields. So I'll talk about all those things early on, and I'll just skip the part that you know they, they may not want to hear 
And in general, even big groups like 300 farmers, that you know, people by the end of the talk are really, they're appreciative of having a discussion about a topic that does affect them. Um, I think that the general public is interested in safe drinking water. So um, usually they're receptive and there are even opportunities for citizen science. Um, for talking with building owners and businesses, it's a little bit different. Um, and that's where you need more of the back and forth and a discussion not just about the risk, but also about the benefits. Before we go on real quick, I just want to say I appreciated that question. We spend a lot of time in the Honors College talking about the need for us to be able to talk across our disciplines and professions and for scientists and engineers to be able to communicate the good science that's being done to people who may not have that expertise and in a way that it can be received. It's really important that the work we do lands where it's intended to help, right? And it can only land there if we develop a language that crosses boundaries. And so I really appreciate that you brought that forth. The, the, the only thing I wanted to add, one thing, is it's so important to have accurate science and data-driven that is reliable because you will lose a lot of credibility. So when you went to these public stakeholders, you needed to make sure you got that information. I think that's been increased, and it's also got to be much more interdisciplinary than, than when I went to school. And that's what we teach now because you're talking to a lot of different groups. And eventually, it's all about trade-offs. You want power, you want bottled water, when Budweiser beer, do you want agriculture, or how much of what? Is it going to be important? And that means you've got to talk the language of all the different groups and bring them together. Okay, so I have a question that's directed particular, particularly at Dr. Taylor and Dr. Rose. So I was just wondering about microplastics and how this affects water quality as well as wildlife health. Go ahead, Joan, first. Well, um, so this is an emerging uh, issue in the water business. Uh, they are, they've developed some diagnostics now and they know that the microplastics are very global and they're finding them in a lot of waters. The, they're not sure about the concentrations and are they concentrating to higher levels and they're not really sure about health effects, especially in humans. Do they just pass through uh, their micron or nano in size? And if we swallow them, do they just pass through the, you know, without causing trouble? Um, so the health effects is very, very uncertain, I think, at least for humans. Um, but they are finding them. Um, it's definitely an area of emerging concerns around the world. And, and fish, uh, we haven't been able to show heavy mortality due to the fish directly. But there's been some concerns about what fish eat, getting it clogged up in the daphnia. Uh, the lower trophic levels where microplastics may affect those um, individuals that then would affect fish indirectly through not having enough food. Uh, for sure, the pharmaceutical companies have had uh, a major impact with the use of pharmaceuticals that can then go into the sewer system, comes, goes into the water, have had effect on fish. And uh, you'll see continued as we got an aging population that uses a number of pharmaceuticals to improve their life or keep them living. Uh, these are ha having major effects on fish populations and other components of the ecosystem. This is a question for uh, David. Um, as far as irrigation in the central plains, especially in the southern portion, um, is there any thought about um, or focus on maybe changing the, the crops from corn and wheat to something that's um, less of a requirement for irrigation? So there have been significant shifts in the types of crops that, that are put into some of these locations. So corn uses more water than, than wheat, for example. So there have been a lot of shifts from corn into wheat. And uh, a lot of the shifts that are happening now are actually being forced. There are a lot of the areas where they just don't have enough water to actually pump and fully irrigate a field. So uh, that is happening here. And in fact, it's happening around the globe. Uh, there are crops like rice that obviously use an immense amount of water. And so as we look at these systems globally, 
there, there's obviously a lot of trade between countries. And for example, in this region I was just in, with Kazakhstan and China, they trade back and forth. And so if they put rice in the correct locations, that overall across that watershed, they can make better choices that are more sustainable. Part of the issue is uh, you have some states that are just managing it as a non-renewable resource. So Texas is an example where they're, they have a 50-50 rule. So they're basically saying, let's manage it such that we have 50% decline in 50 years. Well, uh, that's a pretty short time frame for declining this resource, and the sad part is they're, they're on a much more rapid decline than that. So we can look at options of moving water around. So for example, Kansas has talked about taking the water and pumping it a long distance uphill to get it to these areas. And that's where you get in this debate over you know, economics and energy and food and water, which there's a lot of research on uh, here at this campus and around the world. Okay, we've got a question right here. Okay, so, um I kind of have, I have like two questions. The first one is kind of like a group of things related to like uh, water education. And so like the first group of things kind of has to do with like um, what it means for people in the public, uh, perhaps more in like cities, uh, talking about like what it means to have like chlorine or fluoride or like other like things in tap water that people like whether it's like a major concern or not, people get really worried about like particular things or minerals or whatever that might be in their water, amount of iron or whatnot. And uh, I wonder what like it means going forward to address that and then thinking about um, like water, uh, and that's kind of tied in with water fads, like having like water that's like, uh, what do you call it, like reverse osmosis and stuff like that, which actually like, from what I know, like removes a lot of beneficial minerals from the water. So like what it means, that's like the first question. We're gonna start with Jade on that. Okay. That was long. I'm th All right, <laughs> so <laughs> we, we talked about, or you talked about chlorine residual um, and fluoride. So both of them are regulated by EPA, and the levels are determined um, based on studies that measure toxicity uh, in humans so that they're at a safe level. Um, some of those studies uh, have endpoints like cancer, if it's a, a carcinogen, but there are also newer studies that look at um, intermediate endpoints. So in terms of safety, like these are things that are being evaluated. Um, they're not unknowns in, in terms of uh, worry, because I think you were asking about concern for people in urban environments. I, I could tell you things that you could be concerned about instead, but I don't know that that helps you. <laughs> um, the second part, um, well, I don't know. Joan, do you want to say something about the EPA regulated things first? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so fluoride is still recommended by the Dental Association for most poor communities. Um, there has been data that shows you don't really need to add fluoride in a lot of communities now because of fluoride in toothpaste and, and other nutrition, but it's more the poor. And the Dental Association still supports it. So in a lot of communities, they still will add fluoride to the drinking water. Um, chlorine is mandated in the United States. Uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So we have to have a chlorine residual in public supplies. The, the future, it, it is possible though to run a biologically stable system without chlorine, which the Netherlands do, and they use small pipes. They have a system where the water keeps flowing. You don't have stagnation. Um, but we'd have to really think about that as we revamped our water distribution system. 
Um, distilled water alone, the reverse osmosis on the large scale, uh, they usually stabilize it because um, before they put it back into groundwater or surface waters. So uh, RO that might be used for desalination or things like that on large scale, they, they do have to stabilize it because it is corrosive. For people that drink distilled water, which comes out in some of these bottles, uh, bottled water, there's been a lot of debate on that in Europe about whether that they do know these natural minerals are healthy, and so that's why this mineral water that which comes out of groundwater uh, has to be labeled and protected. So if you get mineral water, it has to have certain minerals. It's mostly groundwater. It's absorbing some of the minerals out of the soil. Um, surface water is you don't, you don't really have those minerals anyway. So um, they think that probably the amount we drink compared to uh, the food and everything else, we're still getting all the minerals we need. Um, so it's probably not affecting our health. But on the big scale, it is corrosive and they do stabilize it. So then uh, the other question I have might be a little bit more cohesive. It's, uh, so this can be directed uh, in the context of fisheries or in the context of humans, I think. It's uh, the question of like hormone disruption and um, what we need to consider moving forward like, oh, what, 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 uh, what would you see as important to consider moving forward when we're talking about hormone disruption from pollutants that might not necessarily cause like a severe physical like reaction in humans or fish, but like degrade like uh, maybe potentially like genetic material over time for humans and fish. Okay, so I was just going to say that um, some of the new testing and endpoints that I was talking about, um, the first uh, set of chemicals that were tested were the endocrine disruptors um, for what you're talking about um, exactly. And currently, they're um, matching exposure testing because it's really the exposure dose that is going to determine whether the effect is likely or not. Um, so these are, again, are things that are on the radar, and I, I don't think that things that are on the radar should be as um, of a concern as other things. I think we're very aware of the uh, the new threat, the relatively new threats, at least in my lifetime, of uh, what goes into the wastewater that we all think just disappears. You know, once it goes through filtration and secondary treatment, we figure hey, the water is clean. Turns out it isn't. There's still a lot of other chemicals that are going down there, and we never thought about it until we started seeing feminization of fish from uh, use of birth control pills and uh, estrogenic compounds get out in the water, and then it affected fish. We said, whoa, how come we're having these different sex ratios? And now we're finding the other parts that affects fish brain size. And the question is, does it affect a human that eats these fish or any of the, any of the uh, pharmaceutical? And so far, they haven't seen it where it affects humans. But we know it is, is affecting fish. Now, much of the fish today, the growing part of fish production is aquaculture. And that itself has. Um, chemicals that are used to make sure that they have high mortality and fast growth rates. That's why you're seeing such a debate about it in the Great Lakes area. Uh, but worldwide, we have tapped out the wild fish resource. And so we have uh, started to increase aquaculture throughout the world. And part of that is because we put dams on rivers uh, and a lot of the fisheries around the world, we collect as much inland fish as we do marine fish. You hear about the marine fish statistics mostly through the FAO, but we actually collect as much inland, but as a subsistence fisheries, that isn't well recorded. And so when these people lose their fisheries, the government usually said, well, let's just do aquaculture. But the water quality is not con controlled. They usually bring in different species. Culturally, it, it's not acceptable. Um, they uh, bring in big tilapia, or big carp, sorry, big uh, carp, like Asian carp, and it's different than the small little fish that they're used to frying up and eating. 
And when they used to fry those little fish up to eat, they'd eat them whole, and it would get calcium. And when they put the dam in, and then they brought in aquaculture pens for big carp, they don't eat the carp bones, they took the fillets. And in Pakistan, um, sorry, Bangladesh, over uh, half a million children came down with rickets when that change was cut. And that was an unanticipated effect. So uh, I think the same thing we're looking at right now with pharmaceuticals. The new ones coming up, they're synthetic, they're novel. We don't know the impact, but it's going to stay in the water. It is going to affect the aquatic environment. Let me ask one last question and then turn it uh, back over to Cynthia to take us out. And that is, uh, and David, really this is uh, both for you on the one side, maybe Joan and anyone else who wants to pick up on it. You were talking about that change in the Southern Plains. And I think someone was hinting at this question, uh, and then I'll, I'll pitch the other half of it to Joan. Should we be able to tell people, I'm sorry, you're just not going to be able to grow those things, that you have to regulate to the point where you're saying, this is simply unacceptable in terms of the amount of water that needs to be put into this specific crop. We've heard this about a little bit in California in relation to, if I remember rightly, almonds and, and almond production in California. To Joan, you know, people put in septic systems for the longest time, and what you're really telling us is that they didn't realize the effect that they would have. How much do people now have to really put up a certain amount of money in terms of this is the bond that you're putting forward before you actually put a septic system in, given the kind of uh, environmental impact that we think that your septic system might have in the surrounding area. So it's really about economic trade-offs. So let me give those to you. Thanks, John. So I, I think the solution isn't mandating you can't grow this crop. I think there, there's stronger mechanisms to affect farmer behavior, and that is incentives. There are a huge amount of incentives in things like the farm bill, and if you incentivize crops that use less water and basically remove incentives from crops that are, are really intensive, either in terms of the water or maybe in terms of the nutrients, there are a, a lot of ways that that can make a very positive effect on, on these systems. Now, of course, even going that far can be challenging because, you know, agriculture is pretty strong and linked to, to a lot of the policymakers. But my hope is that, again, if we have really strong science to support positive changes in these bills, that those types of things will actually happen. Yeah, and I think wastewater reuse, I think uh, the reuse of, of water in urban areas and then thinking about how we recreate our cities for urban and rural connections where the water can be reused in an appropriate manner. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be what's going to sustain Southern California is going to be wastewater reclamation. So in terms of... Um, the issue with septic tanks, so it, it's not that septic tanks don't work, and it was fine when we had one, but now we don't have one, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and they're all around a lake, and there are all these homes around a lake, and um, you know, and you can just, you can go to almost any of the inland lakes in Michigan uh, over the last 20 years and see how many more septic tanks have been added to these recreational areas. And people notice the change in their water quality, um, even though they're not using that water necessarily for drinking purposes. So it's, it's the numbers. And there are new techniques that we could, probably some innovation for individual um, treatment at the septic tank level. But probably it's going to be more sustainable for um, developing uh, better plans for sewering and uh, treating that water. And then maybe it's all in these rural areas. That's the other thing, is a lot of septic tanks are not in the <laughs> urban communities. They're in rural areas. These are areas where we need water in some cases. And so there could be a, a, a good way to think, rethink the development of our rural communities in terms of building wastewater reclamation, but again, I don't think the individual can pay for it. I think we have to have a plan 
that helps um, incentivize, um, uses the state revolving fund to um, provide grants and um, low-cost loans to get this done. I was shocked that in um, a colleague of mine in North Carolina found these donut communities. They're called donut communities. They're small communities. They still have their own well and septic tank inside an urban center. So they're, that's why the name donut. And they haven't been connected to the sewer or to the potable supply. And um, they were missed just as the city, you know, and because they were poor or they weren't, they were annexed or for all these reasons. And uh, I just wonder how many little communities are like that where there's a sewer line running right there, there's a water line running right there, um, but they have the inability to hook up and they're asking the individual to pay. Um, so I think we've got to come up with a better solution in terms of, of sharing the costs because ultimately it'll protect all our water systems, our ecosystems, our recreation, and you know, our health ultimately. And um, before I close out on the septic tank issue, it, it really is a, a zoning issue and a, a service issue, right? So you have the misconnections, but you also have planned developments and singular developments, zoned rural residential, where there is no plan. And, and it's not that it's no plan, there is no intention to provide any type of coordinated municipal services. So it, it really goes beyond the individual homeowner and it has to be something that a county makes a decision about. It, it's not even just the local city, it's a county level decision. Um, I wanna thank our panelists today for helping us kick off this year and share with you, we don't, we don't know if this is coming, but just so that you know how Sharper Focus Wider Lens has been received, We've had both faculty and students talk with us and we've thought about it for ourselves about how do we wrap additional course-based seminars around the work that happens in Sharper Focus Wider Lens. How do we tie it to some of the international engagement that we ask students to do? And our whole intent when we launched this was to say there are really excellent faculty here at Michigan State University and any topic and any theme that we want to debate, we can do it here. We don't have to fly someone in from elsewhere. We can if we want to, but we don't have to. And we wanted the local community and we wanted students to have the opportunity to interact with the great minds here at Michigan State University. And so I just want to thank all panelists, past, present, and future. I want to thank all of the community members and participants that come out all the time. I have to thank Stephanie Cpac and Claire for always ensuring that all of the pieces come together. And John is my partner in all of this. He comes up with the witty topics and finds all of the faculty and conjoles them into being a part of it. And we're just so appreciative of every time that you come out and you're here with us. We hope you will join us again October 30th for Being Russia, and we look forward to seeing you again in the spring. The panelists will be here for a few more moments if you have individual questions for them, and thank you to those who are watching on live stream. Have a good evening.